Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the WSU OSU Tree Fruit Extension webinar series. I am your host today, Ashley Thompson, Oregon State University, Mid Columbia Fruit Tree Extension. Your other two hosts are Matt Whiting, uh, WSU, he's a professor of horticulture located in Prosser, and Bernardita Salato, she is Extension at WSU located in Prosser. So today our topic is going to be scouting and sampling for little cherry and its vectors. And our presenters, our presenters today are Dr. Scott Harper of WSU and the Clean Plant Center, Tiana DuPont, Extension, WSU, Wenatchee, and Dr. Tobin Northfield, WSU um, Entomology. So what we're first gonna cover in this uh, presentation is how one scouts for little cherry. What are you looking for? What symptoms will you see? And this is for both the little cherry virus, uh, little cherry virus one and two, as well as the X disease phytoplasma. Because a lot of these symptoms are very similar between the two organisms. So what you see won't necessarily tell you which organism you're dealing with, but this is the basis of what you're looking for when you're scouting. So we have, the first thing you're gonna see, well, the, the basic symptoms of that are caused by both of these pathogens are the small and the shape and fruit, so much smaller than normal, uh, often the shape and stemming nice round cherries, they're lumpy, they're pointed. The other major thing you might see is poor color development, you might, and if you uh, taste the fruit, you might find that they're lacking in flavor, they're either might be bitter or they might be um, tasteless. Now, one of the important things to note, and we're gonna cover all of these points in detail throughout this presentation, is that the symptoms can eat of the, either of these two pathogens can be confused with unripe fruit until you're very close to harvest. So if you were to look right now, it'd be very hard to tell. I mean, we need to get closer to harvest before the, distant, the differences and the symptoms that this uh, virus is called, or pathogens cause, becomes distinct. And the other thing to, oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that's important to note is particularly early on in the infection, you might only see symptoms on one or two branches. So uh, don't expect it to cover the entire tree straight away. And we'll cover a bit about that when we talk about scouting. So again, here's some of the basic examples of uh, the sample of the symptoms you can see from this. Uh, they're caused by these two pathogens, and we're going to go through each of these in detail, so I won't cover too much about them now. But there, these are bas basic examples of what you will see in shape and point fruit. The small and light colored fruit, and we'll go through a couple of these examples because this is often very misleading about what you see. It's the point I want to make is it's not consistent. What happens with one variety will not necessarily happen with another. And it will often the severity of the symptoms you can see, uh, for example, with pale fruit, how pale it's going to be, does change depending on the stage of infection and the cultivar. So here's an example of small light colored fruit. And this is um, called, this was caused by X disease vinoplasma, and this is crystallina. Now this is a reasonably advanced infection. As you might not see this in the first year, but here you can see uh, some very pale fruit, almost pale yellowish green. This is a very advanced stage or advanced symptom you'll see. The earlier stages of infection, uh, particularly first or second year, might be much paler. You can see some pinker or more mottled uh, fruit there down in the bottom uh, left. That's often what you'll see. Now here's a perfect example of a very advanced, a very pronounced difference. So this is easy to spot, it's, but it often doesn't look as pronounced as this, but this is the sort of the worst it gets. Very small, somewhat lumpy, and very pale fruit, yellowish green, they don't ever ripen and get nice uh, red coloring. You can see what they should look like down below. So this is a very, a very pronounced example. You may not see this, but this is the extent of what you might see. Again, same sort of thing, Rainiers. Uh, they're a little bit, the pale cherries are harder to spot, particularly as the fruit are developing because they remain pale and the color development is much less pronounced. So it's only very, when you get very close to harvest that you see this pronounced symptom of the color change and, and here, obviously the small fruit. Um, so the pale varieties are harder to scout for, but on harvest, they are quite easy to spot in, on advanced infections. So next one. Now, here's an example of the misshapen and pointed fruit. You can have small cherries for a lot of reasons, and we'll cover some of those later. 
that this is one of the more obvious symptoms that we often see with X disease infection, this being crystallina. You also see this sometimes this with the viral infection as well. These smaller fruit that are well, almost more strawberry shaped and with points on the uh, distal ends of the fruit instead of a nice round structure. This is one of the characteristic symptoms of this disease or of the two pathogens and often a very good indication that you have one or two of these pathogens in your sample or in your plant. Now, we've talked about pale, color, pale colors um, in the past couple of slides. One of the things you might notice on some varieties, these being Skeena, is what they done in California, they call buckskin, or it's a, basically a mottling of the fruit. So the color, it, it's not a complete pale color change. You might see part of the fruit, part or some section of it showing this lighter or pale uh, symptoms, but is not as pronounced or as obvious as a complete change to the entire color of the fruit. This is often what you'll see as with a very early stage infection. It's not fully expressed, but it is still a symptom of at least vinoplasma infection. So it's something that when you're scouting, particularly if you haven't seen these symptoms in your block before, this is what you might start seeing first before you see the full blown yellowish green fruit. So this is a very important symptom to look out for because it's very, very easy to miss and it can be mistaken for other things, but it is one of the characteristics of the X disease vinoplasma infection at least. Now, I've mentioned, as I've been talking, that about progressions of symptoms. Because this is, both of these pathogens don't just cause full-blown disease in the first year. And I should note at this point, infection, the symptoms you see are probably responsible, were a result of infection happening the previous year. So this is a slow disease to develop. So within the first year of infection, you might see small or slightly paler fruit on one branch or one cluster. Very, very, very easy to miss as you're scouting. So you have to look at all parts of the tree to make sure you get a good coverage because it's one or two small fruit, very easy to miss within a full cluster, but that is how the infection starts off. Now, as the, the infection progresses in the second and third years and onwards, you start to see more and more symptoms show up on one half of the tree and eventually the entire tree. So this is a disease, you know, these two pathogens cause diseases that progress throughout the tree. They never get any better as well. The, the disease will continue to progress throughout that tree. And then we, at the very end, or later on, it sets into what we call a terminal stage of infection, where you, not only do you see the small fruit symptoms, you start to see reductions in yield. And if you've got a phytoplasma infection, you can see eventual dieback of the limbs. The tree, for phytoplasma at least, will die off in 10 plus years, but we hope you've taken care of the problem by then. So there's just a couple of examples of it um, here in Teton with uh, relatively early infection, a few clusters on different parts of the limbs. And again, so this is a later stage infection. You can see start of the yield is starting to drop and some of the limbs are starting to look a bit bare. Now, if you haven't noticed, the symptoms vary considerably. Um, this is not a, neither of these pathogens causes a clear characteristic symptom that you can say, yes, it's that. The variation is quite noticeable. Here are just examples of all three sample, all three pictures have X disease phytoplasma. There are different stages of infection, possibly different strains of it, and from different locations. What you see in one location, you may not see in, in another. There are other factors that play into this and symptoms can easily be confused with unripe fruit. That's something to always keep in mind. But um, if you see enough of these characteristic symptoms, you should suspect that you have infection. Now, what we're coming to is a symptom checklist. If we've tried to show you examples of what you might see in any given infection from either of the two pathogens. And you can see here from the examples of what some of these things might look like. Now, what we've put together here is a checklist of things that you might want, you should be scouting for when you're going around a tree, looking at all sectors of the tree, look for all of these uh, symptoms that you might see, because you might not see them all, but if you see enough of them, it's characteristic of the disease it's, that you have a pathogen infection in there. So are they smaller than normal? Are the cherries round, misshapen or pointed? 
What about the colour? Is it paler than you would expect for that variety? Do you see mottling or, or blotching, that we buckskin symptoms that we've covered earlier? Now, the other thing you should do, besides looking for external symptoms of this infection, is to cut into the cherry. Look at the pulp. Is the colour of the pulp what you would expect for that variety at that stage of maturity, particularly on at harvest? My, it's sometimes with uh, some varieties, skinnies are a good example, the pulp colour will often be much paler than you would expect for that particular variety. So have a look at the pulp because that's another characteristic symptom. Also look at the seed. In very advanced infections uh, with the pinoplasma, we have seen that the seed, in, the seed is smaller or misshapen or distorted inside the fruit. So sometimes that can be indication that something's wrong. The last thing to do is try tasting the cherry. Now, taste subjective, but if you've tasted enough of them, is it bitter, is it tasteless? Does it not taste right? Because that can be an indication of, um, again, pathogen infection. So when you're working through, these, through this checklist, remember to look for all of these factors because you might not see all of them. Some of them will vary per variety. But what we wanted to present was a, a list that you could go through. And if you see more than one or two of these symptoms, you definitely should get your plants checked out. So, and again, just to handle the point home, all varieties show different symptoms. Every single one of the pictures on the slide, they have X disease infection. They're all infected with a phytoplasma. They're all at roughly the same stage of infection from what we observed on the individual trees. But as you can see here, the symptoms are very different. The strawberries are kind of showing buckskin, the bings are yellow, the chelans, a little bit of buckskin, rainiers are obvious, crystalline is a, a real mix. And the sweethearts are red, but they're much smaller and pointed. So what you get is not consistent. You have to think about each variety separately and don't assume that it's always going to be the same. So work through the checklist and see what you see. What you see. Now, the other thing in these uh, less pictorial slides, are, at least with the phytoplasma from what we've been observing in the past two years, you might even see delayed maturation. So you're at where you expect harvest to be and the fruit just aren't mature. That's one of the things this thing can have. It's harder to describe. I've mentioned pale pulp already and smaller misshapen seeds. Next slide. The point that I'm going to mention with it, it's not just a visual disease. It doesn't just distort the fruit, give you smaller, pale or misshapen fruit. These, these two pathogens also well, this is phytoplasma, but the virus does this too. Also reduces the sugar content, uh, glucose, fructose, sucrose, sorbitol, anthocyanins, and other secondary metabolites that are in the fruit are affected or reduced in concentration, which is why they taste so uh, bit, either bitter or poor. So this is not just affecting the external qualities of the fruit, but also the internal qualities, the flavor, the taste is being affected as well. So this, these two pathogens affect your saleable product. So you need to really scout for these things. Cut open the fruit, taste the fruit, because this is not just a simple visual disease that you need to look for. Okay. Okay, so we, we, we were asked to also talk about things that this can be confused with. So Scott mentioned a number of times that, you know, this, we, we need to be looking at these symptoms when the fruit is almost mature because it can be easily confused with unripe fruit. It's those similar symptoms of low color, um, small size, but there's other things that can cause small fruit, right? So um, overcropping, um, water stress are some things that I see a lot. And then of course, shading of the fruit is going to mean that you have less um, color in that fruit. So let's just kind of go through some of those things to think about when you're trying to decide, hey, do I have a little cherry problem? or is something else going on? So um, bacterial canker and water stress, usually you're gonna be seeing symptoms not just in the fruit, but in the, the tree as well. Um, and think about the distribution. Is it um, just a, a few trees maybe on the ends where you aren't getting as much water? Um, and is it throughout the tree? So usually things like this, um, other disorders are, are, are going to be throughout the tree versus just one or two branches like the, the little cherry, X phytoplasma and little cherry virus. You guys have all seen overcropped fruit. 
which can also always be small, but again, probably gonna be more distributed through the tree. So here you can really see how um, with early infections where you just have a few clusters on this tree that are infected and then some nice big ripe fruit and that contrast can really help you say, yep, this is something I need to pay attention to um, on these trees. So as you grow in peaches and nectarines and uh, plums as well, uh, the phytoplasma, at least, the ecstasy's phytoplasma can also infect peaches, plums, nectarines and other stone fruit. So that's not just exclusive to cherries. And in some ways, it's, a, it's actually a more dangerous and worse disease in these than it is in cherry. So in some ways you see the same sort of symptoms, smaller fruit, they're misshapen, lumpy, they don't mature as fast, and eventually it will kill the tree. So it's a much more aggressive pathogen in peaches. But one of the things that you can look for in peaches and nectarines at least, it's less pronounced in plums, is this yellowing of the leaves. So you see from developing from quite early on in the season, it gets progressively worse. These yellow leaves, the leaves start to yellow. They start curling underwards, so they take on and curling in, so they take on almost a banana-like shape, and they're yellow. And then you start seeing shot holing, which is, uh, do we have a better picture of that? But um, yeah, there we go, perfect. There's shot holing. It looks like, uh, it often looks like fungal infection, but the phytoplasma causes this. You start seeing leaves that start falling away or having pieces of them become necrotic and fall out. So this is a characteristic of ecstasy phytoplasma infection in peaches and nectarines, and often more characteristic. And you might see this before you start seeing symptoms on the fruit because the harvest is a bit later. So be aware, here's a good example of it. The fruit is often small and misshapen. Uh, the maturity even depending on the cultivar is delayed. Uh, the pulp often doesn't mature. It remains quite hard all, all the way through to harvest. And well, you can see from the shape of the fruit, it's quite severely affected. And this happens in peaches, nectarines, and plums as well. So you have to be aware that these, these, this phytoplasma infection can severely impact uh, peach production and, um, and nectarine production. The other thing to keep in mind with um, this phytoplasma in the other stone fruit is it will kill the tree. You'll start seeing very aggressive dieback off, a dieback on either one, usually one side of the tree or one half of the tree if you're on a bee trellis and then eventually the whole tree will die. And it will usually kill us in somewhere in the realm of three to five years after infection. So it is much more aggressive than this is in cherry. So if you see this in your peaches, uh, it's a terminal disease. It's not going to get any better, unfortunately, but it needs something you need to look for um, as these, as well as scouting the cherries because it may very well spread from crop to crop. Yeah, so how do we want to do this scouting? We tried to come up with sort of a, we were asked for a one, two, three. We want just a real simple strategy. And so when you're scouting, you're gonna to wanna to be looking at um, every tree. Remember, we wanna get these infections early before it's spread throughout the block. Um, and looking at both sides of that tree, remember the infections might show up in just one leader at first. Um, some folks are walking their blocks. Some folks are using four wheelers in really low gear in order to um, take a good look at those blocks. And we're doing this the week before harvest um, is really the best time. When you see um, symptoms like what Scott was talking about, small pale fruit, um, you're gonna wanna mark those trees and make sure that you label it with an identifier that you can find again and that is going, you can read again, <laughs> and that you're gonna put on your samples when you send in, when you send them. Some folks to you like to use just basic flagging tape. Some folks are, are painting and then putting another mark through to say that, yes, this tree is gonna go. Um, some folks are using kind of more durable tree tags, um, these kind of paper ones, or these um, cow tags are a bit more expensive. I really think it's a good idea to somehow mark the location, either with a GPS or just the um, dropping a pin on your phone with kind of the upgraded uh, version of, of your um, uh, phone app so that you can find those samples again. Um, we're also gonna be providing with the scouting packets that are going out um, labeled tree tags that will be a little bit more durable um, uh, tree tag compared to just the, the flagging tape, which you'll probably wanna have as well so you can see it from a distance. So 
what are the steps to think about? Well, if you're in a block that does not have either little cherry virus 2 or X phytoplasma confirmed, you're going to want to scout those blocks and mark your suspect trees and send those samples to the lab if, in order to see, do I indeed have a problem or is it um, something else? And then remove those infected trees, um, either using the herbicide cut stump method or pulling the trees, removing as many roots as possible. If you're using a glyphosate herbicide, the nice thing about that is it's gonna, if the tree roots are grafted, have a chance to show that you have adjoining trees um, with herbicide injury, which means they were probably root grafted, and that means the phytoplasma or the virus probably is already in that adjoining tree, and it should just be removed immediately as well. And then we would recommend that you also sample the adjacent tree, one tree out, um, and, and so that you can see if it's also infected to just be as aggressive as possible. And, it, and consider if you're getting more than 20% of a block symptomatic or infected um, and infected, then you probably, considering your economics, might want to just remove that block because we do see this um, curve up of infections where if you know, for example, 20% were infected this year, probably 40% next year, in which case you might not be able to get that block under control. In an organic situation, or if you're not using the herbicide, you're going to want to um, sample those adjacent trees in order to um, see if they're positive and need to be removed as well. On the other hand, if you've already had little cherry virus 2 or X phytoplasma confirmed in the block, once your scouts scout and mark those systematic, excuse me, symptomatic trees, um, you're probably going to want to just directly remove those trees or send in a portion of samples in order to check your scouts um, because you already know it's in the block. And again, following those same steps of removal and adjacent tree sampling to try and get as many of these trees as possible. So, where to sample. If you've got symptomatic trees, you're going to want to sample in the limbs or leaders that have symptoms. That's where the highest concentration of the virus or the phytoplasma is, and so you'll have the least likelihood of a false negative. If the trees don't have symptoms, then you can take one sample from each leader. The material that you're going to send to the lab is going to be four five inch samples from those diseased limbs and you want to make sure to include leaves and fruit stems. Um, according to Scott and, and the folks as they've been looking at this different tissue, that's some of the best tissue for them to be able to um, uh, both get the pathogen as well as be able to process it in the lab. So it's okay if you have fruit, um, but that's not as necessary as those stems. Again, that week before harvest up until August is the time period that we're thinking about too early and you might not have the concentration, but also you can't really see the symptoms. And there is a time period at the end of the summer where the, the concentration in the tree is also gonna drop off. Um, we're not totally sure exactly when that is. Um, it might be later than this, but mid-August should be um, safe in a, in a general year. Please don't send the lab all dry dead tissue. Um, that material is not going to um, be uh, consistent in extracting the, the pathogens um, and you wanna make sure it's clean tissue. As you're packaging up that sample to get it to the lab, think about keeping it at least reasonably cool. If it's gonna get there overnight, it might not need an ice pack. If it's gonna sit around for a while, you might think about it. Don't put that ice pack directly in, into contact with the um, bag. It could you know, make it black like it's been in the freezer. And the places to send labs this year, or excuse me, samples this year is gonna be a little bit different. So um, Scott Harper and his group have been working with the folks from Cascade Analytical, um, both in Yakima and Wenatchee and getting them up to speed so that they can process samples. And their plan is to have a 10 business day turnaround um, and so that you can get your samples back much more quickly. 
Um, and that will allow hopefully to be able to deal with the volumes. And we do have some backup plans in the case that um, uh, they are, are not able to, to deal with the volume. In Oregon, the Oregon State University Plant Clinic can take samples as well. Um, Out-of-state samples from Washington they can take, but it does increase the price. So please, please, please remove these infected trees. This is going to be the way that we curb the um, epidemic. And so scouting this time of year is going to be super critical. We don't want to be in this situation where um, the curve just keeps going up and up. And after this mild winter, um, apparently there's a little bit more possibility for that to happen. So just a couple quick examples to kind of pull it together. Um, so it's to, it's to Milt, um, they scout in groups with a lead scout, so they have someone to ask. They use these paper type tags with a nice printed number as well as flagging tape. And they also GPS locate those trees so that they can find them again and map the progression. They uh, send a portion of their samples to the lab in order to check that their crews um, are, are correctly identifying. So for example, if they have 20 trees that they marked, they're gonna send samples from 10. And if all 10 of those come back positive, then they would remove all of the trees. Um, if there was a combination, then they might go back and, and double check um, before removing all those trees. Um, and they're using the notch and, and drill and inject or cut stump treatment with herbicide to remove trees. At Zirkle, Tia and her group were kind enough to share what they do. They're scouting in teams on four wheelers where they've got folks on four wheelers on both sides of the trees going really nice and slow, looking at every tree on both sides of the tree. Um, and they're removing positive trees and then also sampling the adjoining tree to that um, positive tree. So until they get negative um, samples, knowing that they might have root grafting, that those next trees are already infected but not showing symptoms yet. They're removing trees by removing the tree and pulling as many roots as possible. And when 20 to 30% of the block is infected is kind of their trigger to say, okay, this block probably needs to go. The folks at GS Long are starting out in hotspots, places that they've been identified either by the fieldman or the grower, and then sampling an additional at least 25% of the block. Again, on quads, um, in low gear. And one tip from Garrett is to make sure that you're also looking at those lower limbs and um, the small limbs off the main scaffold where they oftentimes see symptoms. And one thing to think about is that we tend to look up when we're scouting and sometimes miss that lower part of the tree. Um, Dale Goldie shared with us what he's doing. Um, his scouts are walking their blocks. Um, one thing he wanted to um, excuse me, emphasize is that that week before harvest is the critical time. When they've tried to do it earlier, they feel like they've gotten too many false negatives. They're again looking at every tree um, and they're using the drilling and applying herbicide method um, and finding that when they do that in August, they find the trees die really nice and quickly um, from that herbicide and show it in adjoining trees. So we tried to put together a lot of resources for you all. Um, they're just up on the website today is our new um, sampling and scouting, both a flyer, like a trifold flyer in English and Spanish, as well as a 25 page booklet with more pictures of symptoms, actually very similar to the ones you just saw today. Um, and then updated those main pages that you guys are probably mostly familiar with. So I just really want to thank um, all of our collaborators. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but a lot of the pictures were from um, Tia Smith and Hannah Walters and Garrett Bishop, um, as well as information from Dale Goldie and our whole advisory group. So um, thank you to all of you all. I think we really couldn't have done this without you. And please, everybody, um, get out there and, and scout in the next couple weeks. So before we get started with Tobin, I'd like to have uh, you guys answer a few questions that have been sent in. So I think this question is a really great one. Is there any way to scout for symptoms in juvenile trees with no fruit? Unfortunately, no. Uh, the symptoms 
are primarily expressed on the fruit. Um, the effect on the tree itself, uh, pretty hard to tell apart from anything else, so no. Um, the Link Cherry Virus 2 can produce bronzing on the leaves, but that's uh, very much environment driven and I've hardly ever seen it. So I wouldn't rely on that as a diagnostic symptom. No, unfortunately fruit is the only tissue that gives you a reliable symptom that you can scout for. Thank you so much, Scott. So Scott, are you working on any studies or trials that can possibly help us scout sooner for little cherry virus, um, such as during bloom? Are yes. There works for that? Have any uh, good to share? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yes, we are. Um, this year, and uh, part of last year, but certainly this year, we've been following sites that we know have infection uh, from uh, from before bloom, as soon as they were emerging from dormancy, we we're, work, were looking at those trees and starting to track them. Um, it'll be some time before we're ready to say exactly what to look for because there's, we see things, but are they actually associated with the two pathogens remains to be figured out. We're also setting up a field trial this year and of different varieties and deliberately infecting them. And then we're going to be monitoring those so we know the state of infection, we know the pathogens there, then we know what we're looking at. But that's going to be something of a slow process. Uh, I don't expect we'll see an answer to that for a couple of years, I'm afraid. But yeah, we are looking. La last question I have for your section is, are there any symptoms shown in the leaves, shape, color, or size? Not really, no. Um, in, in certain cherries, no, uh, other than the um, bronzing that's been reported for the virus. But again, I wouldn't regard, regard that as completely diagnostic. N then no, the short answer is no. Are there alternative hosts for these two viruses known so far? Um, so for the, I guess I'll do with the viruses first. There's little cherry virus one and two. Both of those can infect um, well, certainly sweet cherry, Prince Avium. They can infect sour cherry and other stone fruits, such as peaches, nectarines, they can get in there. As far as we know, they don't produce much disease on the other stone fruit, but they can certainly infect them. The phytoplasma, uh, being phytoplasma, it's a bit different, but um, that has a much, 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 much wider host range. It can affect pretty much all prunus, uh, as far as we're aware, as well as a number of broadleaf weeds. So it's got a much wider host range. And that's in part due to it being leaf hopper vectored. Do you know of false positives? I guess I'll answer that one. Um, based on the testing protocols that, and uh, methods that are used now, false positives actually, we have never encountered any false positives. You can actually trust a positive. False negatives, yes, they do exist, primarily more for the phytoplasm than the virus, just based on the, the biology of the organism. But false positives, no. Ashley, I would also would like to add this uh, comment uh, from Chelsea about the herbicide application. I think it's important and we have received a couple of questions about when it's more effective. What we have to think about is that at this time of the year, we just starting to, to create um, photosynthates that will go down into the roots. So most of the flow from the bloom time up to now is uh, going up on the trees. And so that's why probably we've seen much more um, effect on the trans uh, transmitting the herbicide towards the roots and to the neighboring trees when we apply this during the summer because we have a flow of photosynthates but also water uh, both ways to the roots and uh, to the shoots. And so I think it's important to take that into account and my advice, and we can discuss this, is that if you know you have a positive tree at this time of the year, it's better just to take it out anyway. And you could leave the stump there if you want to make sure that you don't have root grafting, then you can, if you have root suckers, that means that you, your tree or your roots are still alive and you can spray the herbicide right away when you, as soon as you see the, uh, the suckers. Can you tell us how long after sampling the tissue samples need to be kept cool and how long after sampling tissue samples should be sent to the lab? As soon as you've taken the samples from the tree, if you drag a cooler with you in the um, orchard, it's often a good thing and stick them in. The, the, the quicker you can get them staying cool, the better the tissue will be preserved for the lab to start testing. It degrades pretty quickly, so um, the sooner the better. Someone asked if these um, diseases are present in the Willamette Valley of Oregon? 
I think Jay Scheidt it would really be the person to ask. He and Lori did some sampling in the Willamette Valley of Oregon and they did not find any positives at this time. However, that doesn't mean it's not there necessarily. So we all need to do our due diligence and keep an eye out for it. Just a final note, a lot of you guys that are joining the meeting, thank you very much. We know that it's a very busy time. Thank you, Tobin, Tiana, and Scott for um, hosting and be the speakers of this uh, webinar. But we will ask you to share this information and make your neighbors aware. This is a community effort. So if you can share awareness and, and information and lead them to us, uh, it will be better for all of the industry probably. Thank you, Bernadita and Ashley for organizing it. Thank you all for listening.